morning to those of you in Europe and good morning to those of you in Australia. Welcome to session nine of the ESIG 2021 Spring Technical Workshop. We have another great session lined up for today, looking at what's going on in the evolving world of distribution planning. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As you know, our Spring Workshop sessions are all being held online and are open to everyone. The workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG Offerings Committee, chaired by Bethany Fru of NREL and Julia Matoibasan of ERCA. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who really make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become involved if you're not already. Regarding logistics, I would like to ask you to note that the webinar will be 90 minutes long. We had a lot of feedback that our one hour workshop sessions were too rushed. So we're experimenting with some longer formats for the spring workshop. Our revised format today will have three individual presentations of approximately 20 minutes each in the first hour, followed by 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A after the last speaker. As we are doing with all of our webinars now, we'll be using the Slido platform for managing the Q&A, not the WebEx platform. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter ESIG30 as the event code to ask your questions. Please be sure to indicate the person to whom you are addressing the question. The instructions are also in the background slide for the webinar, and you'll be reminded by the session chair. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question on Slido to allow you to vote on prioritizing the question submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we will address them at the end. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with ESIG30 as the event code. Today's session deals with the evolution of distribution system planning, where I think even Charles Darwin would have a hard time keeping up. Looking at a future where more and more of our generation is going to be DERs located on the distribution system. This is clearly an important topic as we move into the energy transition. The session will be chaired by Miroslav Begovich, currently head of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Texas A&M. Miroslav is an old friend, although not yet a familiar face at ESIG, but I'm working on changing that. Miroslav was a friend of renewables long before renewables were popular, going back to the 90s, when he was on the faculty of Georgia Tech. But I can assure you he's no rambling wreck. I'm very happy to have him here with us today and I hope he'll be back. Miroslav, we appreciate your participation and I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Charlie. It's a great pleasure to be here, especially to, uh, to lead the session and introduce the speakers on such an interesting topic. As far as Charlie's comment on rambling wreck, I started as a hockey doing my PhD at Virginia Tech. Then I became a yellow jacket for 25 years at Georgia Tech, and now I'm an Aggie at Texas A&M and, and uh, enjoying doing that. Uh, we have very interesting presentations to hear, and I would like to start without any uh, further ado with the introduction of our first speaker. The topic of the presentation is UK Open Networks Project and Active Network Management System for Distributed Energy Resources Flexibility. It's going to be introduced by Jason Broughton from Energy Networks Association. Energy Networks Association is the industry body for the energy networks. Their members own and operate the wires and pipes which carry electricity and gas into communities supporting the economy. The wires and pipes are the arteries of the economy delivering energy to over 30 million homes and businesses across the United Kingdom and Ireland. To do this safely and reliably, the businesses which run the networks employ no less than 45,000 people and have spent and invested over 60 billion pounds in the last eight years. Jason Brogdon is a UK-based consultant with a track record of delivery of major reform programs in the energy sector. He's been a project director for the Open Networks Project and at the Energy Networks Association since its inception in, in the late 2016. The Open Networks Project is a flagship ENA project that is laying the foundations for the smart grid in Great Britain 
by transforming the role of grid infrastructure in the energy system. Mr. Brogdon, it's all yours. Thank you very much for that introduction, Miroslav. Hopefully you can confirm you can hear me there. You're well, and so does everybody else, I suppose. Excellent. That means the test drive worked then. So, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, morning, uh, afternoon, evening, dep depending on which geography uh, you're in. Uh, as Miroslav said, I'm Jason. I'm from the Energy Networks Association. And he gave a very good introduction to the Energy Networks Association, so I won't dwell on this slide uh, too much. Uh, but just to highlight that the, the benefits of having a trade association across all network owners and operators in, in GB and Ireland, it means that that middle bullet on the left is is something that we can do um, uh, much more easily maybe in in the UK than in other areas of the world because we have all of those network owners and network operators together in one op in, in one organization it is a real forum for collective work um, and it supports a lot of the objectives that we've been doing in our, our program of work where we're able to look at standardization and, and transparency of data across uh, transmission and distribution networks and, and across different distribution networks in different geographies. So it gives us a real opportunity for collaboration uh, and for standardization of, of practices, uh, systems and processes across uh, different geographies. So it really is, uh, that really is a great benefit to us in, in the UK. And, and we thought it was useful just to set a bit of scene uh, around our regulatory model, because again, uh, different um, uh, nations and uh, jurisdictions have different regulatory frameworks. Uh, we are regulated by Ofgem, the regulator for gas and electricity markets in Great Britain. And, and networks are unbundled in the UK. There's business separation between uh, transmission, distribution, networks and, and retail and, and generation and, and participating wholesale uh, suppliers, generators uh, and retailers of energy. So we have a very distinct uh, unbundled market in, in the UK and uh, the network operators are licensed uh, by the regulator and we're just heading towards our next regulatory period for, for the licenses. So. Uh, we are, uh, for distribution, uh, about to go into our next regulatory period, which means pulling together business plans for investment and discussing those with the regulator uh, with the allowable revenues uh, and, and incentives allowed as part of that regulatory framework. And we have uh, what's called the Rio model in the UK, uh, which allows for performance-based framework on a TOTEX model, which really does drive down costs for consumers. Uh, and it gives us uh, incentives to, to innovate um, uh, and introduce non-build solutions, which is a lot of what we've been doing over the journey of open networks. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, later. And that agile regulatory framework helps us uh, and, and it helps all of, all of the licensees in, in the UK. So I think the challenge that's faced us uh, in, in the UK is, is very familiar to, to probably everybody. Uh, the movement from a traditional one-way power system from generation, transmission, distribution uh, and consumption to a much more flexible, smarter energy system with uh, multilateral flows between uh, a, a numerous set of different sources of generation, uh, storage uh, and consumption. And so that gives uh, the energy networks in the UK as it does everywhere else an unprecedented challenge, uh, particularly with, with decarbonisation. Um, but we are looking now at, at a really significant organisational change for all of those network operators who are moving from more traditional engineering businesses uh, focused on investment in assets and, and that transmission and distribution of energy into much more digital, decentralized organizations using technology and commercial services to give us the most cost-effective means of operating, managing, and investing in our networks. So that is the, the challenge that we've been looking to address through our Open Networks project. Uh, and as I said, is a collaborative effort across all of the network operators and network owners. 
And our, our objectives in, in our open networks project have, have been pretty static through um, the, the four and a half years that we've been operating. What has changed is, is the way in which we've gone about it and the body of work that we've, developing, that we've been developing. And what we've also seen over that four years are those two words up in the top right hand corner there, net zero. We've seen um, the, the journey and the objective to net zero coming through strongly in government policy and, and our work is a key facilitator towards that. So if we can deliver a smarter, more effective uh, network set of networks for both planning um, and, and operation, then we can help um, Britain in our uh, market build uh, effective networks to net zero. And our two main objectives from a, from a customer and consumer perspective is uh, we want to help customers connect uh, and connect more easily uh, and more cost effectively and open sources of revenue for those connecting customers through through markets. And that's something that has, has come through much more strongly in our work more recently. And then overall, reducing cost to consumers through through more cost effective planning and operation. So those those two key objectives underpin everything we do. There are a number of uh, government objectives and policy uh, papers that have set out uh, the route to net zero, which we are contributing towards, uh, and that is recognised by by the government in in GB. And the last bullet is really important. Um, because of our regulatory framework, because of the opportunity to use innovation funding to trial and test aspects of, of smart grid, uh, we're able to take a learn by doing approach. So there are a number of trials that we have run and we are running and that we are starting off the back of the work at Open Networks to actually um, take, take an approach of learn by doing and, and do these things in practice. So if I just give a bit, a, a bit of background on the journey we've been on, because um, when we started off looking at open networks, we were very focused on transmission and distribution, how we coordinate transmission and distribution and how we get um, better effective planning and, and operation between um, those, those two sets of networks. And, and very quickly, it, it evolved into much more than that. Uh, we started looking at distribution system operation, DSO, which, which for us is looking at what functions and activities are required to operate um, a distribution system operation at a more local level more effectively. So what we started uh, by doing was defining what distribution system operation looked like, uh, and that's over in the far left hand corner, the functions and activities associated with it. We then analyzed what the processes might look like, and we started to look at the roles and responsibilities for, for delivering some of those smart grid functions. So we set a pathway towards effective um, uh, distribution system operation, and, and we're now implementing um, that pathway. As we've gone through that journey, what we have seen is we've seen market opportunities opening up as we go for, for more cost effective um, uh, system planning and investment. So we've seen that network oper operators have the opportunity to go out and procure flexibility services from, from distributed um, energy resources and use them as an alternative to investment in wires in the air and substations and wires in the ground. So there's, we, we've seen um, the markets for flexibility services, particularly at a local level, um, grow over the time that we've been uh, running our open networks project. And what that means for us is that it means the focus of our project has changed a lot over the last two or three years. And we're now much more focused on opening those markets for connected customers, for storage, for generation, for demand turn down, um, and, and standardizing the offer of those services across different geographies so that one customer or one um, uh, type of customer can connect in different geographies uh, and, and contract for the same service under the same terms and conditions so that we're reducing the barriers to entry for those market participants. So opening those markets and standardizing the way in which we procure and contract for those services is a really important aspect uh, of what we're doing. And what that does is it delivers uh, most cost-effective networks 
by by using um, our existing and and connecting distributed energy resources rather than um, uh, just by default investing in in new network infrastructure. So it's very much been a journey that we've been on over the last few years, and 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 it's one that that other um, jurisdictions have been through as well. And I said earlier, um, when when it came to distribution system operation, we've got some more detail on how we went through that journey, um, what we did for defining what those future worlds for distribution system might oper operation might look like, the methodology we used how we assess the cost benefits associated with pathways towards the future. And now, now we are uh, publishing our DSO implementation plan that shows the practicality of how we're doing it over um, a time scale over the next um, 10 plus years. So we, we now have a, a detailed DSO implementation plan that shows how we're delivering against the activities and functions that are required for distribution system operation. So it's been quite some journey to get there, but um, it, it is now about implementing and doing rather than um, looking at the art of the possible, which is where we started. So I, I mentioned flexibility earlier and markets, and, and that's absolutely fundamental to what we're doing. And, and at the end of 2018, the distribution network operators, the local uh, network operators made the commitment to openly test the market for uh, uh, the comparison of all um, significant uh, new projects for grid reinforcement. So that means that all of those businesses have made a commitment to go to market in order to look at the most cost effective way of investing in their network. And we've taken that further now, we've taken it into a set of implementation next steps, and, and that has underpinned the work that we've been doing around common processes, common contracts, transparency of data, uh, and, and also working towards whole system outcomes. So not only are we standardizing our offers across uh, distribution network operators in just different geographies, we're also looking to standardize those offers at a transmission level and a distribution level. So we're looking to move towards framework uh, style agreements with, with tenders for service, very similar to um, our transmission electricity system operator offers for, for balancing services. So um, it, it is a key drive towards opening markets for, cons for, for connected customers. The, the more standard the markets are, the more standard the contracts are, the more standard the processes that we follow are, the easier it is for customers to engage and, and realize revenue for their connected assets. So, so it, it is an unashamed drive towards transparency and standardization um, that, that we are doing as a, as a group of network operators, and that benefits everybody. And just to give an example of uh, the growth in local flexibility services that have, that, uh, that we've seen in, in GB over the last few years, I won't go through those numbers, but you can see the uptick from uh, 2018 through to uh, 2021. We, uh, along the um, X axis along the top, uh, sustain, secure, dynamic and restore. Those are the four standard uh, DSO services we have in, in GB for flexibility services. And you can see how the, the markets for those services have grown. And, and that's not a coincidence. One, um, all of the network operators are, are, are looking to do more um, uh, as a cost effective alternative to network reinforcement. But also, the more we standardize, the more people are, are able to use those standardized processes, contracts, and services in order to go to market and the easier it is for consumers to, for connected customers to engage. So it really does demonstrate how we are able to, to contract and, and the liquidity, the increase in liquidity of these markets for local flexibility services. Again, for most cost effective planning and investment. We have a number of work streams in our in our projects that, that look at development uh, of these different areas. So uh, the flexibility services work stream is the one that's looking at that standardization of, of flexibility products. The top right, the, the work stream 1B, the whole electricity system planning is looking at where we're continuing to look at efficiencies between transmission and distribution, uh, both at uh, planning 
and, and an operational level. Uh, particularly, we've been looking at how we can standardize our signposting for future network requirements. So in advance of going to market for procurement, you have to understand you have network need there. So what we've been doing again is looking at how we can standardize the signposting of those future network requirements so that customers can better understand where they might be able to connect to networks to realize value for, for assets. Uh, and that helps them, uh, helps them make their business case. Uh, and it helps them know where geographically to um, to connect to to realise the most value for what they're connecting onto the network. Uh, the bottom left, we've been looking at our connection processes, but also very importantly, our um, our transparency of data. And we've been publishing more and more data on the uh, resources that are connected to the networks. And the bottom right is something that we've been doing uh, over the last couple of years, which is coordinating gas and electricity. So uh, there are opportunities for investment efficiencies between both gas and electricity networks, uh, particularly where you've got, um, for example, embedded uh, gas fired power stations is where is the most appropriate place to invest, invest in network, given the resources that are being deployed on both type of network. And that is a very interesting initiative looking across both. And then uh, lying over the top of it is this uh, DSO transition work stream where we're, we're looking at that implementation plan that I talked about earlier. So key priorities um, um, and where we've got to now, flexibility remains the largest area of work with the highest priority. Um, we want to open markets. We want to introduce standardization for customers so that they can realize value. Uh, and that then meets network operator objectives, it meets regulatory objectives, and it meets government and consumer objectives, because that helps us build that pathway to net zero. So um, flexibility is, is our largest area of work at the moment, and that has changed significantly over time. Um, if I was going to put a, a, a broad percentage on it, it's maybe up to half, half of our work this year. Whereas last year it was probably down at about 25, 20, 25% and the year before it, we were just starting to think about it. So that's come to the fore um, very recently uh, because of these market opportunities and because of the driver to um, effective in investment planning. We've also um, continued to work very closely with some of our regulatory colleagues. Um, if we're going to move towards distribution system operation, if we're going to implement all of these activities that are described in, in the plan, then that has an impact on our regulatory settlements. So um, that becomes part of our business plans that we're submitting to the regulator for, for investment for the next five year window. And now that we've got more clarity from government, um, we're, we're able to, to concentrate on delivering against some of their key policy objectives. So the opening of local flexibility markets, um, also pace in, in connections. Um, there is a, a big body of work being done by the regulator at the moment around um, connection charging, which will impact um, which will impact significantly on on how we go about our work in open networks and, and flexibility markets more generally. Uh, but we have been looking at how we can uh, facilitate connections to customers uh, quicker and and better on the better terms. Um, opening of data is absolutely key. The more transparent and open we can be with data, uh, again, the better customers can understand um, the opportunities that are available to them. Uh, there is a separate uh, data initiative, data and digitalization initiative in ENA, uh, which would be worth uh, if people are interested in digitalization and how we going about uh, opening data, that would be a useful thing for you to, to follow up on uh, with ENA. Uh, so we are, uh, we have an underlying principle of opening data uh, and that will continue. And the, the, the efficiencies between network companies, particularly, particularly uh, transmission and distribution, but also across standardization across different geographies for distribution. I've got a set of links in here that um, uh, you will have the slides published to you. So hopefully you'll be able to look at the links that, I, that I've got at the back of this slide deck. And we do have an opportunity for people to get involved through public consultations, public events, and we have a mailing list uh, out of uh, open networks that people can be informed on uh, what, uh, you can get briefed on what we've been dropping, what's coming, uh, what events are coming. So 
uh, I, I would encourage you please to join the mailing list. You'll get emails on a regular basis that gives you an update on the project and, and our initiatives. Um, I know some of the events might not necessarily uh, coincide with uh, different time zones, but um, hopefully you'll get the chance to see what's going on. And uh, Miroslav, that brings me to, to an end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Jason. This was a very interesting presentation. I'm already seeing a few questions coming in and I have a few of my own, but in the interest of time and consistency and coherency of, of discussions, I will introduce our second speaker, uh, Nick Miller, who uh, will present uh, a topic under frequency load shedding and distributed energy resources. Nick recently retired from General Electric after three eighths of a century of experience and research on bulk power systems. He has lectured on wind and solar power integration to governments and institutions in more than three dozen countries. He currently provides consulting ex expertise to a variety of private and public institutions on topics of grid integration of renewable resources. He holds 20 US patents for wind, solar, and grid technologies, is a fellow of IEEE, a New York professional engineer, active in CGRE and IEC. He has authored over 150 technical papers and articles and is the recipient of several power industry awards. Nick, all Okay, yours. Miroslav, thanks for the introduction and uh, hi everybody. Always nice to be back here at, uh, at ESIG. Uh, everybody uh, mute, please. We got a little bit of echo. So uh, I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes to go over what will amount to actually a relatively simple, uh, almost an aha problem with a relatively uh, difficult solution. So, and uh, true to form, I get to be a little dramatic because I'm old and cranky. So here's the uh, Hickory Ledge power plant uh, in the picture here with my line to uh, to giant energy storage right uh, next to the power plant, and uh, I'm gonna talk about under-frequency load shedding. So just uh, uh, at the risk of being tedious here, I'm gonna uh, have a slide to remind you what under-frequency load shedding is, and I've got a few quotes from NERC, so, um, and highlight the, some of the critical uh, words here. So under-frequency load shedding is there uh, as a measure to, uh, to restore balance between grid uh, generation and load. Um, it is generally intended for severe lack of generation and it automatically disconnects end use loads. Uh, typically through pre, uh, through design distribution circuits and there's a whole bunch of NERC standards, particularly PRC 06, 006 that establish the rules for under frequency load shedding. And most of the folks on the call here will find this old hat, this uh, old figure up on the right is just taken out of the standard and shows the, uh, the frequency tolerance getting tighter as time goes on. Um, I highlight the idea that this is a, res a resource of last resort. Uh, nevertheless, it looms large in a great deal of activities around uh, the integration of uh, variable renewables and uh, ends up being a boundary condition for an awful lot of practice. and. Uh, well, we are not going to be able to uh, continue that particular luxury for much longer, and I'm going to walk you why through why. So, uh, most of what I'm going to say today is said in more uh, detail and rather nicely in the in the new NERC reliability guideline. You see in that little call out down to the right, this is a, a guideline talking about the interaction between under frequency load shedding and distributed resources. Um, it's quite a good document. My presentation today is true to form, uh, 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 consists of a bunch of cartoons because that's the way I communicate. And I start here with a figure out of one of the NERC, uh, uh, NERC spider uh, modeling documents where we have on the top right sort of today's uh, composite distribution system in which um, uh, on the uh, on there, we have uh, connection to the grid and then a blob in red that is in the world of bulk power system analysis, um, uh, all lump, I say lump together, uh, modeled together today uh, with lots of detail. 
And uh, it's that construct that we're starting to have to uh, take uh, into account with under frequency load shedding. So once again, on this figure, I repeat that diagram, but on the left, I've added some orange arrows uh, to call out the key elements for this discussion. So in our, uh, in our bulk power system view, and remember under frequency load shedding there as a, is as a bulk power system resource, uh, we have power flowing down into uh, what today is a relatively complicated distribution system. Um, that power is uh, under conditions with distributed generation, a uh, subset of the total power serving the load. So all of those, uh, those little symbols on the right hand side of the uh, internal bus of this equivalent are variations on load. Um, that what those little uh, pieces mean is a lecture for another day, but embedded down there is the uh, is the residential the R D E R, which, for the sake of today's discussion, is we're going to start with talking about it as rooftop uh, PV, although it need not be that. So the sum of the power coming down from the grid and the power being delivered delivered by the uh, embedded generation serves the load. So, so what? If I disconnect this entire red uh, box by under frequency load shedding, the benefit to the grid is the reduction of P UFLS. Uh, but the customers interrupted are P load. So as there's more distributed generation uh, supplying the local load, that's lost when we disconnect as well. Uh, so we're not talking about intentional islanding and breaking into microgrids or whatever. That's a topic for another day. We're talking about dumping this feeder and all its distributed generation as well as load. So on the right, I just made a real simple little graph and the orange line is the, is the efficacy of the under frequency load shedding. So for each megawatt of load that I disconnect from the bulk power system, uh, I disconnect more than one unit of customer. And that's what uh, the, the uh, gray line is. And I've called it kind of arbitrarily, and maybe that's open for discussion, what a good word is, is the adversity. The amount of load trip divided uh, the amount of customers tripped divided by the benefit to the grid. So the gray line is the inverse of the orange line. And um, if half of the customer load is being served by distributed uh, generation, then I have to trip twice as many customers to get uh, to uh, realize the systemic benefit. And as we go down into the red box down on the lower right, it's actually possible for the action of tripping the system uh, to have a net negative effect when uh, we have over 100% instantaneous penetration in that load. So um, we've got a brewing problem. I say brewing, for the most part, we aren't there yet. So this is a cautionary uh, discussion today, not an endpoint. Um, on the right, I've got two recent uh, um, uh, load and net load uh, curves, one from ISO New England, one from Cal ISO, both on relatively sunny days, as we've both taken within the last year. And uh, we're going to assume in a very broad brush uh, fashion that, that um, every feeder tripped is representative of this instantaneous penetration of PV. Clearly, that's not true. We're going to dig into that. But um, uh, on these sunny spring days, we are going to be tripping uh, 1.36 customers for every one unit of benefit in ISO New England and uh, uh, one and a quarter customers for every one unit of benefit in Cal ISO. All right. Um, you might say maybe we could tolerate that. Uh, and I'm going to ask that question in a minute. There are systems for which uh, we are already at a point for which that 
action is unacceptable. So let's look a little harder at that in the next slide. Clearly today, we are, uh, we're gonna have to wrestle with this. Having that number be 1.1, whatever, maybe one and a quarter, maybe two is acceptable. At some point, we have a societal cost for which that the crudeness of just dumping until we're, we're, uh, we're good is A, not gonna be very effective, and B, isn't gonna be very secure. So there's some steps forward and some utilities, uh, and I'll note later, I think I actually spell it out later, uh, for example, Helco, yeah, on the Big Island has already wrestled with this, and that is the idea that at the least we can keep a constant monitoring of the total power that will be uh, beneficial to the bulk power system that is trip per operation and dynamically decide uh, how the under frequency load shedding is armed. So that is a that is a significant increase in intelligence over the set it and forget it, but it doesn't address the adversity aspect. And that is, we're still gonna disconnect more customers than we want, um, but uh, th then we strictly need, if you will, but at least we're gonna disconnect the right amount. And also by doing that, uh, we can set some priorities on who gets tripped uh, in a dynamic fashion rather than today's usual practice of trying to do that uh, once and passively. So I've got a little cartoon here that you will recognize, uh, well, you recognize that I make cartoons all the time. Uh, so this is uh, Nick's uh, uh, simple-minded uh, distribution system with four feeders and one, one point of connection at the substation. A real simple uh, under frequency load shedding would clear the entire subsystem opening that, that uh, black box. And in the course of doing that, I'm gonna lose on my third feeder with the red colored breaker, I'll lose the PV and uh, the best that I've postulated is on that particular feeder. Um, so I have uh, some adversity and I've lost some generation, I've lost the best. Uh, I can take this a step farther in intelligence and say, oh, well, don't trip the feeder with the PV and the best and trip the other feeders. That is a systemically superior solution, um, as long as I know that those other feeders uh, are ones that I won't be losing uh, a contribution for. It isn't particularly simple to keep track of that if it's a moving target, and maybe it's not fair. Gee, the feeders that happen to live, the customers that happen to live on the PV feeder don't get tripped for under frequency load shedding because they live near PV or the best, and the other, folks that live on the other feeder, uh, you know, lucky you, you get tripped uh, four fifths of the time more often in some sort of uh, simple arithmetic. Um, so we can partially address this adversity at the cost of some complexity. We can be smarter by constantly updating uh, that sort of thing so that the right ones are armed. But at some point that becomes uh, intractable, all right? Uh, so I may have taken one, that one feeder out of the mix, but as I move on to this world where I have many PVs, maybe many uh, uh, batteries and a variety of critical loads, which are shown in red, um, I also now have a very complicated system for which the old pick which feeder you're gonna trip doesn't uh, have the desired outcome. So in this cartoon, uh, we've got some color coding and it's pretty small, but hopefully you could read it. I'm saying, uh, look, you can't get away with tripping the feeder at some point in the future. Um, I'm gonna lose uh, resources. I'm gonna trip loads that I can't uh, afford to trip that are societally unacceptable to trip. I am gonna lose resources that may be providing other essential reliability services which I've shown in purple. So how do I do this? And the answer is to move to some level of granularity and trip, uh, uh, trip, the, res trip the load resources in some fashion uh, uh, by being much more selective. This is a tall order, right? Uh, 
and I, I'm not saying that we need to get there uh, lightly, but you can see uh, that in this topology with a significant uh, penetration, I can't be uh, taking this entire system out uh, with the hope of saving the bulk power system. So how do you do that? Do we need to have super uh, wide uh, bandwidth communication? Uh, is it possible to make those candidates that are shown in green autonomous? If they are autonomous, do they all act exactly the same? Probably not. Should they be staggered? Um, should they adapt to the condition of the system? And how are they going to communicate with the rest, with the bulk power system, to tell the bulk power system what they are capable and in intending to do in the event of, an, uh, of some disturbance? And how are those pieces going to work with the system when you try to put it back together? Um, uh, now, some of the system, some of the, supposing that this thing is successful and arrests the frequency and the system comes back, how do you let them come back? And if it's unsuccessful and the system goes back black, how do you put them back on? And how do you pay for this? Is this a paid service? At the moment, UFLS tends to be uh, involuntary and unpaid. Um, is that an acceptable paradigm? So we're looking at quite a bit of intelligence and overlay here, and it and it begs the question: How does this fit in the broader uh, context of the distributed resources being active uh, participants in the grid? So this is some small, frankly, but critical slice that pushes against or maybe meshes with uh, the talk that Jason just gave. Um, so how do we get there? So let's look a little further and ask, okay, this isn't just a question of power. Uh, those distributed resources are providing other services, as Jason said. Some of those services are going to be important during the kinds of events that trigger under frequency load shedding. So now we've got a real, uh, an even more difficult question. You cannot have, maybe you cannot have the under frequency load shedding uh, taking out those resources that are providing uh, frequency response. Or, as I, uh, which was actually the genesis of me putting this talk together, being told, no, those distributed resources that are subject to tripping by under frequency scheme, our under frequency scheme, are not candidates to provide that uh, essential reliability service. That's my orange language here. Uh, so this isn't just some theoretical possibility. This is something that I have actually heard. No, you're not gonna get frequency ERS from the DERs because those lines might go out on under frequency. And that's, to my mind, a big woe as an industry. Do we want to go there? And is it even legal? I don't know the answer, but I would guess that at least some interpretations in the new FERC order 2222 say, nah, nah, nah. You've got to let give a, a give level ground for the participation of these de distributed resources to provide that under frequent that uh, essential reliability service. Okay, so uh, we're backing ourselves. Uh, into a corner if we insist on maintaining the old under frequency uh, paradigm. So let's go on. The other si slice of this pie is that as systems get progressively lower inertia, and of course, many of you have heard me talk about low inertia systems and uh, all IBR systems. Um, the reality is, is as the as the inertia drops, and inertia drops in systems uh, that are still that are possibly subject to big offense under frequency load shedding needs to get faster and faster and at some point it can't be reliably faster it takes time to measure frequency and rock off well if you try to do it too fast uh, you end up with garbage results you cannot differentiate so one concept that might extend, extend uh, the life of under frequency load shedding is to recognize that maybe it's not the tool for handling every event. And I have seen in several systems, there's a degree of bimodality, which is to say, 
there's a couple of things I I meant I call them terrifying events that make uh, that are that loom in the minds of the system planners and operators. This one, two, four big events, separation from the neighbor or loss of this particular giant resource is just a lot worse than everything else. And can we use some other means, special protective systems, SPS, remedial action scenes, or other things that rely on information like this breaker just opened. We are in the soup. We need to act. You don't need to wait until something, until the frequency drops. Once this breaker is open or once this condition is satisfied, we have an unbalanced problem and we don't need to wait for frequency. So I include yet another cartoon on this slide. Uh, and some very simple graphs I made. The idea here on the left is that as the inertia drops, the size of the event that leads to uh, leads to higher rock offs uh, drops. So as those lines get hotter color, warmer colors, the relative uh, size of the event uh, and inertia that will cause higher and higher rock off uh, goes up. At rock off of of four hertz per second, which is admittedly gigantic by North American standards, but not necessarily gigantic by small system standards. A rock off of four hertz per second gives you gives you uh, uh, 250 milliseconds to uh, to catch the system. Right? It, we don't have time. We don't have time to make these uh, connections. So the idea here is that you can have some uh, 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 special protective schemes that will capture the big ones and regular ones that will capture the little guys. So let's go on. I'm going to wrap up, Mirathlon. So in summary, um, today's set it and forget it UFLS are coming to the end of life. Uh, there's too much adverse customer impact and too little uh, efficacy. So the next generation of under frequency load shedding is going to have to be more selective and more situationally aware. Uh, we're going to need to move away from uh, from this in, uh, involuntary UFLS to autonomous and voluntary systems, uh, both for practicality and to meet the FERC order. And that leaves us a few questions for the researchers um, to ask, when is this, when are the wheels going to fall off? We aren't there yet. Uh, how do we address the communications bandwidth? Things need to be very fast or autonomous or both. And that's one of the balance questions uh, that I think is warrant, warranted. We have a market question. Why the heck are we disconnecting people involuntarily anyway? Shouldn't that be a paid service? And if so, what's the right market construct? How do you ensure fairness? And how do you make this cyber secure? So with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Nick. Great presentation, lots of questions. Hopefully we'll get uh, some, oh, I, I'm seeing them popping out on the, on the slide also. Okay, let's uh, proceed without further ado with our last presentation of the day. It's entitled Black Start from Distributed Energy Resources, and it will be presented by Dr. Wahan Geborgian from NREL. After obtaining his master's and bachelor's in electrical engineering at Yerevan Polytechnic Institute in Armenia, and his PhD in electrical engineering at State Engineering University of Armenia, Dr. Wahan Geborgian joined NREL in October 1994. He's currently Chief Engineer for Grid Integration, where he's involved in many research projects related to grid integration aspects of variable renewable generation and energy storage. He currently leads several research projects funded by various U.S. Department of Energy programs, including projects funded by wind, solar, and water power technology offices. He also leads a number of collaborative projects with the U.S. and international energy industry members and is a member of the IEC team for wind turbine power quality standards. His contributions to NREL research have been recognized through multiple outstanding individual and team staff awards. Bahan, it's all yours. Thank you, Miroslav, for introduction. Apologize, everyone. I'll stop my video. I'm having uh, some bandwidth issues here. Um, so, 
today I'll be uh, speaking about, uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of NRL team um, about um, research uh, we do that involves um, Black Start application utilizing um, variable generation plants and energy storage. And this research is mainly focused about technical aspects of Black Start, including control and stability challenges uh, for, uh, for these applications. Um, just to remind everyone, um, the Black Start uh, is, is essentially a process of restoring the operation of the either uh, single electric power plant or a part of the electric grid without relying on the external help uh, from the rest of the grid because uh, during the blackout, you lose that help. Um, so, and it is a very, Black Start is a very important foundational aspect of, for a resilient uh, and, and secure grid. The Black Start um, process normally has uh, several stages. Um, at a very high level, it's a preparation stage where you want to understand what happened, what's going on to your system. In many cases, your state estimation won't work. So uh, you need some intelligence to uh, understand the status of a system and identify the boundaries of a Black Start. And then the next stage is uh, the network reconfiguring and establishing cranking paths uh, for your Black Star resources to start energizing uh, portions of the loads. And, um, and then starting at least one Black Star unit or combination of units, and, and then with a gradual and progressive restoration, step by step um, until um, uh, the, and, and, and also this needs to be done in a very uh, stable, uh, manner to avoid any instabilities and, 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 and conditions that may cause to trip off the loads or generation. Um, the restoration strategies, I mean, in, at a very high level can be also divided into serial restoration strategies where you start one unit at a time or more complicated parallel strategies where you use some sort of a coordinated approach which will require more complex controls and, and also communication. So historically, the, um, the block start and restoration schemes in the utilities were mainly uh, top-down, utilizing top-down approach. Um, the, um, in the recent years, with the progress of the uh, advanced controls in the, uh, in the inverter-based resources, um, the, uh, the bottom-up approach also is gaining the great interest. Uh, from utilities. This is uh, becoming more important after the recent events, for example, the, uh, uh, the blackout in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, where lots of people in Puerto Rico have been without power for many months. So this bottom-up approach would have been a very useful for systems like that. Even the recent event in Texas probably would have benefited uh, if there was an ability for a bottom uh, bottom up uh, approach for a block start, for example, from uh, PV uh, and storage units. The um, um, the the most important uh, uh, aspect uh, to to enable the the, the block start for um, for for a bottom up approach is availability of a grid forming. Uh, resources on a, on a distribution or sub transmission level. And that mainly uh, today by many is being viewed as a, uh, in a form of a grid forming battery, although other inverter based resources technically are also capable of providing uh, grid forming capability. Um, the, if you have a grid forming capability in your system, then uh, you can choose from different restoration methods, uh, depending on the characteristics of your system type of the outage and the blackout, uh, type of resources available and the criticality of the loads. Uh, but you can uh, form a one big single island, for example, or multiple islands. Uh, you can have one core island and then use it as a uh, uh, startup resource for the uh, rest of the system nearby. You can energize just a transmission system. And then also you can have, of course, combination of different type of top down and bottom up restoration. So the main challenges during the block start and during the island operation of a system are no different than uh, what we are facing uh, in, in any system with the high shares of inverter-based resources. Uh, they, are, they are well known. Um, the, uh, 
the system strength um, and the low short circuit ratio is one important one. Um, the, the, that also translates into a voltage, a possible voltage instabilities. Um, they also need an inrush currents uh, to energize transformers and, and the transmission lines and, and, and other reactive loads. Uh, which may also be a challenge because inverter based resources have very little overcurrent capability. This also, in turn, poses some challenges on the protection because uh, you need, even during the block start and islanded operation, you need to protect the equipment and people. And if you don't have short circuit current levels, adequate short circuit current levels, then uh, you may jeopardize both equipment and people. And, and then, of course, as it was mentioned before, the uh, the low or zero inertia uh, situations, depending on the, uh, uh, you know, what type of system you are trying to block start. Uh, there may be control interactions between inverter based resources during the block start and during calendar operation. And of course, you need to balance uh, both load and generation uh, under highly variable resource. If you are utilizing the, the block start in, in the system with the high levels of uh, uh, wind, wind and solar generation. Um, the other forms of block start also can be in the form when uh, distributed generation um, is used to block start conventional uh, or to crank start the conventional block start units. Some examples are shown here. For example, the co-located co uh, PV storage system can be used to uh, crank start uh, any conventional uh, fossil generation units uh, by starting the, the auxiliary loads. Uh, it can be either co-located or remote uh, block star resource for these units. Um, then um, uh, the other strategy may include or other configuration may include where the PV storage system, for example, starts uh, as a uh, acts as a full uh, fully functional block star source for a conventional plant, starting it and letting um, uh, synchronize with uh, with a battery inverter uh, with a uh, with a consecutive. Uh, uh, connection with the rest of the system and also various type of collective black start uh, strategies uh, are possible too. Um, there is a great interest uh, in a resiliency in general and in a black start aspect uh, uh, for a, for a power systems um, utilizing the uh, high levels of inverter based resources uh, from the uh, various programs of US Department of Energy. Huge amount of research is being done at a national lab complex. Um, at Tenerel in particular, there are several, uh, this is the highlights of several uh, projects going on at Tenerel. Of course, the list is much longer to show here. Uh, but both uh, wind and solar energy technology offices uh, show great interest in this capability by wind and solar PV generation, uh, uh, res respectfully, of course. The water power technology office is very interested to demonstrate and, and conduct research in a block start utilizing uh, the hydropower generation. Um, we have project funded by office of electricity that is looking at the combination of grid forming battery and the synchronous condenser for many use cases, but the block start, of course, is one important one. Um, we're also looking at a, uh, a block start use case from a hybrid power plants. One example is the uh, uh, grid modernization initiative funded flex power project at NRL. We are also doing uh, many uh, 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 island research projects in, in collaboration with island utilities, Puerto Rico, USVI, Aruba, Hawaii, and so uh, to look at also block start strategies uh, utilizing grid forming resources uh, in, uh, in island systems. So uh, one example of the uh, um, uh, block start application utilizing the uh, wind power is a project funded by WITO that NRL is doing in collaboration with the GE. And that involves uh, demonstration of a grid forming wind turbine um, for different applications, as I said, including the block start. Many of this project involved not only a testing and demonstration, but also modeling stages. So for this particular one, we're still in a modeling stage where we're looking at how this uh, grid forming wind turbines uh, can be used uh, to provide various services to the grid, including resiliency services in the form of a block start and islanded operation. In this particular scenario, we're actually looking at a wind power plant that has combination of both grid forming and grid following, uh, conventional grid following wind turbines and looking at the uh, stability aspects uh, of that operation. 
Um, for uh, uh, the for the water program, uh, one interesting project is the uh, demonstration of the grid. For, I'm sorry, the Black Star capability by Ranova River um, hybrid power plant, and Ifag will be doing demonstration of in, a, in a real world demonstration in coming weeks. Uh, this is a project led by um, Idaho National Lab, and demonstration will be done in Idaho Falls Power. We in combine in collaboration with the local utility. And we'll be using the real plant on the um, uh, Snake River. Uh, we are already finished the modeling stage for those, both non real time and the power hardware in a loop. This is an example of the power hardware in a loop simulation utilizing the real time model of the uh, uh, Randover River plant combined with a grid forming and grid following batteries utilizing General's grid simulator. So, different strategies have been employed here. The main challenge in here is that this uh, zero head or, or very low head uh, hydropower plants, they have, they have not been designed to operate um, uh, in islanded mode. So every time you have a step change in load, it causes the huge change in RPM, which in turn may cause the uh, under frequency or over frequency triggering. So the battery, the purpose of a battery is actually to help and stabilize uh, that black star process. So we are very excited about this demonstration very soon this spring. Uh, another interesting project, interesting project, as I mentioned, and which can be also used for both distributed, some transmission and transmission levels, is the uh, so-called SuperFacts. It stands for Super Flexible AC Transmission System. Uh, as I said, this is a, a solution that looks at the combination of grid forming battery and the synchronous condenser uh, under the same control operating as a plant or as a single block, which can be sized in, 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 uh, in any direction, both power uh, uh, capacity, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the power um, uh, energy capacity, and also the uh, short circuit current levels. And it can be used uh, for many applications, taking the best from both worlds, from uh, rotating machines and from inverter-based resources. Um, so the idea is to have these modules uh, that can be deployed uh, at any uh, at any levels in a power system to provide the benefits that energy storage is providing, especially the grid forming energy storage, in combination with the synchronous condenser to maintain the grid strength and provide the uh, short circuit current contribution, and also provide the inrush currents during the block start when you energize different components in this particular use case. The battery can also be used to block start the synchronous condenser itself. And then this whole system as a unit can become a black star resource for the rest of the grid. Number of uh, uh, simulations have been done for this. And um, we think that this might be a good solution to be deployed at any level of a power system, because in addition to block start benefit, which uh, can be used in any, any place in the grid, uh, this type of solution can also provide many other benefits, whether you are substituting the, uh, uh, the retiring plants, um, or at the transmission operation level, uh, used for um, wind and solar integration, uh, provide be as a power quality source for the loads, and even at the distribution and some sub transmission applications as well. So uh, this particular technology uh, uses a different uh, advanced uh, controls by the grid forming battery. One is the ability of a battery to to increase its voltage uh, in a ramp in a ramping way. Uh, so this way we eliminate or bring it down to very low level the uh, the inrush currents during energizing the transformers, for example. For this purpose, we're using the SMA inverter uh, with our battery storage and SMA provided these controls. And I think it's already commercially available uh, feature for, for SMA inverters. So you can see a difference between two cases, hard start and soft start. We're essentially eliminating any in rush currents by doing the soft start with the PV, uh, I'm sorry, with the storage battery. And, and this way, uh, you know, you don't need to oversize uh, uh, your battery inverter for that. Um, then the battery itself also can be used to accelerate uh, the, uh, uh, the synchronous condenser during the block start. Energy from a battery is using essentially the, uh, we used to, to operate a small VFD motor. Uh, which is interesting when you need to slow down the synchronous condenser for maintenance, you put that energy back into a battery, making that essentially energy neutral process. So, as I said, number of use cases have, have been have been demonstrated with this. This is one modeled example where we use the superfax concept to energize in a model, of course, the big portion of the uh, transmission grid 
Um, so you can see that at every stage uh, we're closing one circuit breaker. And the, uh, when synchronous condenser and battery are, are energized, uh, the synchronous condenser is taking most of a burden for providing the inrush current when you are energizing each portion of a grid at a time. So if you have a wind and solar generation in a nearby, these units can also be used to block start uh, wind and PV power plants as well. Um, we're planning to demonstrate this in a real hardware utilizing the testing capabilities at NRL's Flat Islands campus. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll do it in a real, using the real hardware, synchronous condenser, grid forming battery, real wind and so solar generation at the site, and also utilizing our multi megawatt medium voltage grid simulator uh, to emulate different type of the uh, networks in a real time and different type of the uh, block start in the island lead operation strategies, of course. Um, so we already did one very interesting demonstration utilizing these assets because the real time, real, real life situation made us to do it. This is a, a aerial view of a site where we have a grid forming battery, PV array, and the battery and the building with its loads. Uh, last fall, we had an unfortunate incident at the substation that fits the site. This is a photo when it happened. So for several weeks in a row, this site didn't have any access to the electric grid. So we accelerated our research control development and operated the site in 100% renewable as 100% renewable microgrid, where the uh, grid forming battery actually was the essential piece of that of that operation. Uh, we implemented very interesting controls in here, where battery is operating not only in uh, frequency power and uh, uh, voltage reactive power groups as a conventional way of operating grid forming resources. We also implemented some additional loops in terms of power state of charge groups. So this battery is using the frequency, only a frequency, grid frequency as a communication means to drive the active power set points for other components. This way, uh, you know, the controlling the balance of a power in a system and in the same time uh, protecting itself from overcharging or undercharging. So in this manner, we have been able to operate the system for many 24 hours in a row without any stability challenges. This is an example of one such operation in the bottom. The blue is a side load. Of course, we have an advantage of oversized wind and solar generation in this case, which allows us to very effectively balance uh, the load and generation by when needed, we can curtail the wind and solar. So on the top, it's a state of charge of a battery and the grid frequency in, in, in green. So what seems to be a, like a, pretty chaotic and, and bad frequency control in reality is exactly the control I, as i described the battery is using the grid frequency as a means to communicate the set points to a wind and solar generation uh, to keep the system under balance and in the same time to keep its state of charge within prescribed boundaries uh, here is another case where we intentionally introduced huge variability in the loads of adding big uh, step change in a load using the load band um, this event also coincided with a cold front, cold front passing through Colorado. So all these cyclic loads you see is a heating in the buildings coming on, but the system was able to balance itself with a very minimum controls and communication in a very stable way, in such a way that the people who work at the site they had no idea where the power is, was coming from, from grid or, or from this uh, regular grid or from the, this renewable microgrid. So this was a very exciting demonstration. The capability is there. And we're planning to do more demonstration utilizing the other assets such as synchronous condensers and so forth. So as a summary, um, I'd like to stress out that um, um, in the, today and future restoration strategies should align with a, a quick changing network paradigm um, and uh, availability of a distributed generation and energy storage and their capability to provide different types of services must be utilized for a block start as well. The modern grid forming inverters can contribute into a block start and restoration. Uh, they have more superior reactive power capabilities actually com compared to uh, conventional synchronous resources of the same size. This very simple chart is actually providing uh, that, uh, uh, that demonstration. The only limit, as I mentioned, is the important one is the uh, a bit, uh, limited ability of inverter based resources to provide short circuit current contribution, which can be which can be solved by utilization of either synchronous condensers or oversized inverters, or some other advanced or some other means. 
Uh, more field demonstrations are needed to build in industry and stakeholder confidence in this approach. And of course, some suitable business models need to be developed for inverter-based resources to provide these services uh, because uh, inverter-based resources can do many things and uh, other services in the Black Star needs to be uh, adequately compensated and the revenue stream must be in place to encourage people to provide this service. With that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rohan. A very interesting presentation to, to conclude this series of three. Um, at this time, we have about 20 minutes left to answer some questions, and I would encourage you to uh, look uh, at the Slido dot com and uh, see whether questions uh, that are already submitted answer your interest and you can also vote for those that you think are um, most interesting currently at the top of that heap is the question asked 29 minutes ago so it was directed to nick but i think everybody can uh, chime in frequency events severe enough to trip under frequency load shedding are extremely rare. How can the number of customers tripped be of consequence compared to storms and I suppose other extreme weather events? Well, uh, you know, the the reality is that is that under frequency load shedding events, particularly in the in the bulk, you know, the, the large interconnections are indeed extremely rare. And as Nurk says, it's the it's the uh, re resource of last resort. So I certainly would not advocate that uh, we give up that last. The, my point is that it is going to get progressively lower efficacy. And uh, yeah, certainly the examples I gave that you need to trip 36%. 30%, maybe 50% more load for something so rare, pale compared to the system going black. Uh, nevertheless, as you, you see from my from that cartoon, um, you know, you, we are moving in a direction where the efficacy is going to start to asymptotically, not asymptotically, approach zero and possibly go negative. Uh, so, I think the argument that we need to start considering an alternative uh, is pretty strong. I certainly don't believe that we're at a crisis point yet. So, yeah. Thank you. This looks like the, the next question also is directed to you, which is about incentives that could provide uh, uh, availability and uh, or load shedding and energy services at medium and low voltage distribution. Yeah, well, you, you know, I, there's already inroads in this front, um, right? So, so many systems, I'll just use ERCOT, who has done a good job, uses, you know, load acting as resource, LARV, and they get some of their essential reliability services from load. I would argue that that basic concept needs to be broadened um and has needs some more granularity so a customer that will be interrupted once a year or once a decade has got a different economic uh uh sensitivity than somebody that will be called on daily and we need market structures that will recognize that difference thank you the next question is directly the, directed to Jason. He already addressed, I think, a little bit of that in his presentation later after the question was asked, but maybe another chance of defining flexibility uh, in broader sense in distribution systems. I think, I mean, uh, ultimately, ultimately, flexibility is the ability to control or schedule demand uh, and or generation depending on local network needs. So it's doing that activity down at a distributed uh, distribution level. And, and the way that we've defined the flexibility services in, in GB uh, at a DNO level are, are in our four products. So that is 
um, a, a sustain, which is a, an ongoing, a managing an ongoing requirement to reduce peak demand. So it's typically well in advance, dispatch for a fixed fee. Uh, secure, which is managing peak demand, and uh, normally weekday evenings uh, in the UK, I'm sure uh, the same elsewhere. Uh, dynamic, which is uh, supporting network in fault conditions, uh, often during maintenance, and then restore, which is uh, supporting the network during fault uh, as a result of equipment failing. We've heard uh, quite a lot about that today. So, um, flexibility itself uh, is is defined as the ability to control um, or schedule demand or generation, and, and those four services are the way in which we're going out to market to to procure that in in GB. And that's that's um, in addition to to the services that are that are, um, are procured at an ESO level at a transmission level. And actually, it's in in another question deep down. One of the things we've done quite a lot of work on is looking at um, the stacking of services between transmission level services and DNO level services. Uh, how those services can can be worked together, and how you can offer uh, multiple services uh, across both transmission and and distribution level services, and particularly um, we're starting to look at things like privacy rules. So Nick talked quite a lot about about this these sorts of potentials for conflict uh, in dispatching services, and that's something that. You know, we're starting to get to, to well, we've already started to get to grips with, and we're now starting to look at you know things like privacy rules for services to to be more definitive. Thank you. Uh, I I think that uh, you have also addressed the next question uh, about the privacy and security. I, I just wanted to give you a a chance to address. You mentioned demand response. Uh, what are your experience with it so far, and which categories of uh, participants are most uh, willing to 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 do that yeah so to, to, i mean demand response is a is is a very active source of flexibility and and the type of customers who participate in it tend to be uh, what we what we tend to find for distributed energy resources is that uh, a lot of uh, the services are procured through aggregators through third parties who get uh, who go out and recruit customers or groups of customers in order to aggregate together uh, demand side response and, and increasingly now generation and, and battery as well. So um, there are some very active third party aggregators in, in the British market that are, are going to customers and, and aggregating up that um, low demand or, or potential for generation and storage in order to um, uh, make a more compelling offer. So it tend, tends to be through those those third parties, and I, I will just address that that data question because I, I talked about open data, and and there are some principles around open data established, um, and and uh, Mike Mike's quite right. You know, there is a trade off between uh, open accessible data and security and privacy concerns, and also commercial concerns. So what what we've done is. We've defined a, a data triage process that presumes data is open, but challenges it through a process to say, is there, uh, is there a commercial issue for making that data available? Is there a security issue for making that data available? Is there a privacy issue for making that data available? Or is there a consumer impact issue? And depending on that triage process, you, you may um, constrain who you share that data with or you may retain it as closed if it's commercially sensitive, for example. So we have defined a data triage process, and that's that's continuing um, to be an active piece of work uh, worked on under uh, the data and digitalization work at ENA. Thank you. Um, I will uh, try to disrupt uh, the order of popularity of questions a little with something quite uh, important and, and interesting uh, for question for Vahan. Uh, how would you compare the Black Star with uh, distributed energy resources with the Black Star with conventional ones, and uh, in terms of uh, times, costs, challenges of all kinds? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, the main challenge when you do a Black Star with a variable generation is you need to have that resource available, right? So, uh, whether wind and solar. 
Uh, in some cases, if you have to do block start as soon as possible and the wind and solar is not there, uh, of course, that creates challenge because you have to wait for it. But uh, in case of, for example, I mentioned that the Puerto Rico where people had to uh, live without electric power for many months in a row, waiting for a few extra hours or half a day or a day, uh, it's probably much better, right? So it's all, it's all, uh, uh, it's, it's all matter of perspective. So the, the main challenges, as I mentioned, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's basically the, the variability of a resource, um, the uh, issues related to energizing portions of a grid, that, whether it's a distribution, sub-transmission or transmission, um, and then uh, challenges related with the island grid operations of the 100% IBRs, inverter-based resources, because uh, in many cases, when you start the grid from a bottom-up approach using wind and solar and storage, for example, those are going to be the only generation assets. Uh, so these are these are the main challenges. Uh, if the resource is there or you have energy storage in place, the uh, block start can be can be essentially very quick. If you have intelligence uh, and controls to identify the boundaries of your of your system, uh, but but again, you have to do it in any case, whether is it. Uh, uh, variable generation or a conventional generation. So once it's established and, uh, uh, you know, you can safely start the system very quick. <clears throat> Hopefully it answers your question. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good. Um, another one is for Nick. How much would it help if under frequency load shedding is armed only when feeder has normal flow, uh, meaning not reverse flow as a set and forget it strategy? Well, it, you know, let, the the uh, at some point it becomes relative. You know, the cost of 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 your interrupting customers starts to become difficult. You know, hard to bear. I don't know where that threshold is. Uh, you, you also have, you know, what they did at at Helco and these dynamic ones where the system is constantly watching how much will be tripped by a specific operation goes a long ways towards buying us time before we run into trouble so i wanted to be complimentary for example of what helco has done They're, they clearly have moved in the right direction at some point that isn't going to work for us and i don't know exactly what that point is the one other point i'll be quiet is is this feeds into what Bahan was talking about as well Imagine I trip a, a feeder that is at three quarters distribution loading. So I get one megawatt for four megawatts that I tripped. And I don't know that. I don't have enough situational awareness. And I go to put the system back together and the Han system picks up four megawatts when it thought it was only gonna pick up one. Uh, it clobbers the system or it's successful. And then the other three megawatts of, of PV comes back on its own and it goes from zero to four to one. Those are real challenges for the for the topology that the Han is talking about. So again, this is the argument for situational awareness. Thank you, Nick. Another question for Vahan. How could you do collective black start resource with distributed assets with in between loads in rush too big, even with ramp for any one asset? um yeah definitely that might be a challenge so uh, if you are doing just one step uh, energizing with one inverter um, you can utilize that soft start approach but if you have more more uh, steps to do then uh, your inverter is already at the full voltage so you can't take advantage of that so this was the main reason why we started looking at this uh, possibility of paralleling or including synchronous condenser um, uh, uh, with a uh, grid forming battery um, to take care of that. But uh, in some cases, all depends on a, a relative size of the uh, uh, loads and the feeders, the reactive capability, uh, relative size to the capability of your inverter base resources, right? So in some cases, it can be sized, but uh, you still can do it. Um, so, um, that's one of the topic of research. We're trying to come up actually with the methodology to do it by doing the number of uh, simulations and then try to validate our models in that 
in those testings I mentioned. So after that, hopefully we'll be able to generate some publications with a uh, guide to the industry on how to size these uh, resources for different applications, including Blackstar. Thank you. You seem to have answered the next question as well. So I will ask uh, next one, Jason, it's coming from Charlie. How does open networks deal with uh, under frequency load shedding and black star? Yeah, I think I think I probably um, it's probably wrapped into some of the answers that I gave earlier around the work we've done around stacking of services between transmission and, and distribution uh, and providing clarity on on what those services are and how they interact. And one of the things that we identified was uh, the need for, as I said earlier, the need for primacy rules and clear principles for addressing flexibility service conflicts between transmission and distribution. Uh, and, and that's something we're working on on this year and that that will ultimately need to balance the technical requirements and risks for, for the whole system uh, with the needs of, of flexibility procurement uh, value for the service providers and, and ultimately the end consumer. So. That that's the next body of work that, that we're undertaking. I think it's quite a, a, a leading piece of work. And, and on Black Start more generally, um, uh, National Grid in, in GB has been running a distributed restart um, a project as well, which is, is also been looking uh, at the opportunities for using DER for, for Black, uh, Black Start um, situations as well. So. Uh, very complementary to what to what Vahan was uh, talking through. So, if you want to have a look at a GB version of of that, then um, I, I would point you at uh, the National Grid ESO's uh, distributed restart program as well. Thank you. And uh, next question also for Nick uh, about uh, number of TSOs that are currently having enough dynamic megavolt amp reactives to handle five to ten percent load shedding an impact that it could produce? Uh, I'm not sure I have a lot to uh, offer on that. Certainly, the, the you know, this is the intersection of the, um, uh, 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 of this revolution with weaker grids, IBR, uh, conditions that might have resulted in perfectly satisfactory or at least tolerable voltages in a system that was stiffer and had different reactive capability, different short circuit strengths, uh, those are all pieces. So, um, I, you know, there's no substitute for good engineering. I don't have a good answer for that, for uh, Peter. Yeah, that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, one, one more for Vahan, I think we're close to running out of time, but this is an interesting one. Combining PV and battery for Black Start. Currently, the standard method is to only use battery for Black Start and then bring in PV. Um, the, uh, yes, thank you for your question. So, the methodology we implemented and de demonstrated at the site, utilizing grid forming battery uh, and the real PV plant. So, we basically Yes, correct. We uh, use the grid forming battery to energize uh, its own transformer, energize the feeder, energize the transformer or PV plant. After that, PV inverters started in a normal way. For them, as there's no difference, right? Whether the, whether the voltage is set by a battery or a grid. So after the battery started, uh, I'm sorry, the PV plant started, it started generating the power. So some of that energy went into a battery. And at that point, we started gradually bringing up the load uh, to the degree that it matches both uh, generation and the load. And then the system was running by itself and we let the battery to, to do a balancing in, in the meantime. So you are right, the grid forming uh, battery is a, a first resource to start, but after that the PV can be started and then so on. If you have a grid forming PV inverters, of course that's a different story. Uh, the grid forming PV inverters themselves can be a black start resource. Uh, and they can be started either at the same time with the battery or in some sort of a coordinated way. Oh, thank you. And we may have ju just a quick uh, minute for uh, Jason to answer Charlie's question about what network penetration of DER has been, are being planned in the UK. 
that that is not a short answer i'm afraid miroslav but <laughs> there, there are a number of uh, different uh, uh plans out in for, for gb networks from sort of short-term uh development statements through network development plans talked about a little earlier and the future energy scenarios i think um I, i'm i'm going to ask, answer that with a slightly different answer which is um uh, one of our objectives that we're trying to do in in open networks is to encourage uh, DER by adding revenue streams to to make more investment cases for for the connection of DER. So the more we can do to make markets, the more we can encourage DER, uh, and and the more we can contribute to the path to net zero. So maybe maybe I, I'll leave you on that nice soundbite. Thank you. We have a lot of interesting questions, and even though next one deals with my own uh, home turf with uh, ERCOT uh, AMI meters, I think it's time. To wrap it up, uh, I would like to thank our panelists for their great presentations and for equally interesting discussion today, and thank all of you for your participation. I think that this session has offered some great insights into how distribution system planning is evolving, and I hope it has provided some stimulating food for thought for everyone. I would also like to remind you that the spring workshop sessions are being held on Tuesdays and Thursdays through April 8th. There is a session this Thursday on the evolving hybrid power plant chaired by Derek Stanklick of Telos Energy. There is no change for the sessions and you're all invited to attend. Further information on registration is provided on ESIG website at www.esig.energy. Thanks again for your participation. Stay safe, and we're looking forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you.